is Messi. It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. It's time for the biggest sports stories. Liverpool, the champions of Europe, are top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behaviour. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world, in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's CFM Sport. Let's join the team for the biggest show in the world of sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station. It's a Friday. Good evening, everybody. Let's hope the party has started. Difficult to imagine in these circumstances with social distancing and all the places closing early. So this is our offering to you to get some sort of a party going as we head into the weekend. But it's going to be one filled with sport and lots of action. My name is Mike Madoda. It's ZFM Sport, your favorite sports show on your favorite station. ZFM Stereo, my station, your station, and your favorite team is here. Barry Manandi, Sean Tafirinika, our producer, as well as Chris Gray. What can you look forward to on the home front? Zimbabwe-born cricket prodigy Tawanda Muyeye, who recently completed the high school at Eastbourne College in East Sussex in the United Kingdom and was named the Wisdom Schools Cricketer of the Year, has hinted that he may never feature for Zimbabwe. We also have some international sports news. Now, according to English writer Stuart Barnes, Borden Barrett is at risk of losing out his Spot as a starting All Black in favor of Richie Mwanga and Damien McKenzie. We'll get here the sentiments, the thoughts of the team in studio when we hit that story. We take you around the world in 60, starting off in Manchester, where Joffre Archer's biosecure breach could have been a disaster for English cricket, costing tens of millions of pounds. In Ohio, Tony Finau ended a high-scoring first day with the outright lead, as Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods both made encouraging starts at the Memorial Tournament. And in Florida, NBA scoring leader James Harden practiced with his Houston Rockets teammates for the first time in more than four months yesterday, saying his arrival at the league's restart by at Walt Disney World was delayed by family issues. We'll then take in our Fire Friday play of the day before we get into the beautiful game. And Zidane held Real Madrid's latest La Liga triumph as one of his best days in the professional game. In the Premier League, Leicester boss Brendan Rodgers challenged his team to make more history after victory over Sheffield United secured European football for next season. And Inter Milan eased past bottom side Spal last night, winning 4-0 away to move second in Serie A and close the gap on leaders Juventus to six points with five games remained to be played. That and so much more to look forward to in this edition of ZFM Sport on a Friday. It is indeed a fire Friday and first and foremost comes our power play and today it is the reprisal of that legendary track by Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? This time it's been given a bit of effect by Kygo with Tina Turner herself still on the track. Warriors, the Chevrons, the Cheetahs, the Mighty Warriors, and the Sables. From the pool to the track to the field, we are Team Zimbabwe. The Home Front. Local sports news and analysis. As usual, we start on the home front with some local sports news where Zimbabwe-born cricket prodigy Tawanda Muye, who recently completed high school at Eastbourne College in East Sussex, England, and was named the Wisdom Schools Cricketer of the Year, has hinted that he may never feature for Zimbabwe. The 19-year-old reckons Zimbabwe is not a conducive country to nature, his sporting and life ambitions. The promising youngster also added that his main worry is there is no security in Zim cricket, saying that over the years, the administration of the game in Zimbabwe has mishandled issues like salaries for players and the selection sometimes was not done on merit. A pretty strong sentiments coming through from Tawanda Muyeye. Those of you who don't know this youngster, he obviously made headlines when he was uh, uh, given that uh, Wizard Award earlier in the year. He started playing his cricket at Ruzao Junior School out in Marondera before moving to Peterhouse. From there, he moved to Eastbourne College in England, where he then rose to 
be the 2019 schools cricketer of the year so he has a bit about him Barry but he's also been casting his eye back home where he started his cricket career as a schoolboy and Zimbabwe is simply not attractive enough yeah, absolutely, Mike. I think he's looked at it and, and perhaps we can believe Matt's word for one, uh, that what he says is actually what his considerations are. But I'm going to say there's a second aspect and I think he's looking at himself and his abilities and the fact that he's winning accolades, uh, receiving acclaim from England and the cricket establishment in England. And he's thinking to himself, perhaps I have a good go at getting into the Three Lions setup, and possibly that could be part of his consideration as well. Well, he certainly is a, a gifted youngster, isn't he, Chris? If you take a look at his record at junior level here in Zimbabwe, he has twice represented Zim at cricket tournaments uh, playing in South Africa. That was in 2014. In fact, he was so good that... Um, the coach Stephen Mangongo made him one of the non-travelling reserves for the 2018 ICC Under-19 Cricket World Cup, which was held in New Zealand at the age of 15. So Zimbabwe cricket uh, had their eyes on him and they clearly recognised that he is a talent. But Barry's brought up the issue now that uh, the youngster may well have had his head turned by England and wants to have a three Lions career. Is he good enough? Is it a wise move at this age? to be totally ruling out Zimbabwe? I would think no. Um, and that's because the level of competition that exists in England, period, the grooming that the people who will be competing with have already received, I think is significantly higher. I think for you to be, first of all, a Zimbabwean-born player who moved there quite recently and then to kick on into a proper professional setup, I think is going to be more challenging than he would expect. And um, I think looking at Zimbabwe could still be an option for him, especially because it's, it would be significantly easier for him to represent Zimbabwe than it would be to represent England. In terms of, look, his aspirations and wanting to play for England, first of all, he's incredibly young and possibly even a little bit naive. So he could be looking at this and thinking, oh, you know what, I just got this award. So probably I'm... I'm uh, definitely one for the picking in terms of playing for England. But that jump, that leap is huge. Um, he needs to be playing in the professional leagues in England first to even be given that selection before he can consider to actually write off playing for Zimbabwe at all. So I think he, he needs to be a little bit more cautious. And also, look, Zimbabwe is, in as much as we can look at it right now and think, okay, economically, in terms of Zimbabwe cricket, it's probably not a favorable environment. But Zimbabwe is turn and fortunes could happen at any point. And this is not, a, I don't think it's, it's an opportunity that he'd want to discard completely, at least not right now. He's 19 years old. He's 19 years old and uh, his father, who is based here in Zimbabwe, has uh, confirmed that uh, the lad still holds a Zimbabwean passport uh, and uh, he has not yet acquired a British passport. So that's one thing going for Zimbabwe, Barry, the fact that uh, he's still got the green passport. Uh, and also, uh, Chris makes the pertinent point that um, it's a big leap from schoolboy cricket to playing for the three Lions, to being one of the elite cricketers in England. Because there is the, listen, first of all, you've got to negotiate your way through uh, the development stages uh, in England and also the county setup, you know, Division 2, Division 1. You've got to be there, thereabouts before we can even start talking about you as being a potential three Lions man. Absolutely. And um, when you get to the, to the elite level, get to the top level, remember, that's why they call it the open category. You're competing with everyone. Yes. When you're at age group, when you're in age group sides, you're competing with a limited number. So it's all of those that are eligible. Chances are it's between the ages of uh, 17, 18 and 19. So because very rarely will you find an under 16 breaking through. But, and, and those are few and far between. So the, the, the range of selection is limited, meaning that your chances are, are far greater. When you get to the elite and top level, you should have, number one, been refined, gone through the fire, be your, the best that you can be, uh, number one. And then number two, you're competing with such a large pool of players who've gone through various uh, um, uh, refinement processes that you don't know what your chances actually are. I'm going to give a footballing example. Brendan Galloway, at one stage, at Everton Football Club, 
one of the 18 most definitely, sometimes selected in the 11 for Everton Football Club. Yeah. Thought to himself, no, I might have a chance at the three Lions, having represented at, at junior age group sides. Zimbabwe approaches him under Philip Chiangwa and says, come and play for Zimbabwe. He said no. Where is he now? Yeah, absolutely, Barry. That, that is a worrying thing. And of course, I think whenever you are, and, and that's Galloway born in the United Kingdom. Now, for this case, this is a youngster born in Zimbabwe, Chris. And I feel like you have to work doubly hard uh, if you are from another country to go and fly the flag. We've seen like the players that have represented England uh, in, in previous stints and even now, like Kevin Peterson, who came from South Africa. But Kevin Peterson was a world-class player, one of the leading batsmen in the world. And therefore, he merited his place in that English team. But he always had to perform to keep his place. And now we look at Jofra Archer. Jofra Archer has got to work doubly hard to be in that side. And when he doesn't work for him, as we shall see later in one of our stories, when Jofra Archer makes a mistake, it's amplified because you're only ac accepted as far as you're doing well. But when it goes wrong, you are now all of a sudden the West Indian uh, born Jofra Archer. And in this case, it'll be the Zimbabwe born uh, <laughs> Tawanda Muyeye. <laughs> Definitely. And you, I think it's if you're playing for your own country, the country you were born in, um, I think you can be good. You can be very good. But if you'd like to represent, say, for example, in Tawanda Muyeye's case, you want to represent England, you have to be absolutely exceptional. And it, 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 look, he's, he's a fantastic athlete so far. We're seeing him, um, you know, all of the development that he's come across, you know, being selected at 15 um, for the Under-19 Cricket World Cup, all of that. He's an, a talented player. But is he exceptional? And that gap between being good and being exceptional is, is where everything happens. So unless he's incredibly exceptional to the point where England themselves can't ignore him and would want him playing for England that badly, then I, I don't think it's something that's necessarily within reach. Yeah, and, and I always think uh, to myself if that there's a young Englishman, you know, who is England, uh, probably uh, born in Nottingham, uh, played for Nottinghamshire, you know, during the, the, the for the junior teams, and he's equally as good as Muye. Who do the English selectors go? I think there's a bias towards the English born player. They're going to yeah, pick 100%. one of their own unless you are exceptional. So you do make a fine point there, Chris, that he has to be exceptional if he is to turn the eye of the English selectors. Now, a quick update out of Zimbabwe cricket. Zimbabwe cricket team batting coach Stuart Matsikinyere says the Chevrons are doing their best under the difficult COVID-19 lockdown conditions to maintain good shape. They're preparing for the proposed resumption of their international calendar. The team embarked on a training camp last month following a lengthy layoff. The Chevrons, who are still hoping to host Afghanistan in five T20 internationals, were given the green light to start training by government. Let's hope the worsening situation as far as the coronavirus pandemic is concerned here in Zimbabwe is not going to lead to further disruptions in the world of sport. This is EFM Sport coming up. We've got a local sports news roundup, basketball, baseball, as well as sport administration. And then we'll give you that story that's coming out of England. Bowden Barrett, is he at risk of losing out his spot in the starting all Black 15. Hi, my name is Sean Williams, Zimbabwe cricket captain. You're listening to ZFM Sport. Z. All right, time for a local sports news roundup. Now, the Secretary General of the Wilaya Basketball Association, Francis Dubé, is hoping that COVID-19 would be under control by the time the country gets into summer to allow the city to host the Southern Africa 3x3 basketball tournament in December. Ten countries have confirmed their participation in the fourth edition of the Southern Africa 3x3 Under-18 basketball tournament to be held in Ulaayo from the 3rd to the 6th of December. The 3x3 basketball is a version of the game played by three players aside scoring in one basketball hoop. Each game is 15 minutes long or ends when one team reaches 21 points, whichever comes first. Zimbabwe won the previous event held in Botswana last year. Over to baseball news, now coach Shepard Sibanda is excited to be leading the introduction of the new version of the game, based for 5 in Rulawayo and is hoping it will attract player and fan interest soon. Sibanda, who is an instructor at the WBSC, will lead the promotion of 
Baseball 5 in Wulaya with John Mazziro leading the Harare leg. Baseball 5 is a fast-paced, youth-focused, urban discipline and small-sided version of baseball or softball. The game has been included in the sports program of the Youth Olympic Games in Dakar, scheduled for 2022. Wrap it up with some news from a sports administration front where following the launch of the government COVID-19 relief package, national associations have begun applying for funds on behalf of their top athletes. Last week, the government, through the Ministry of Youth, Sports, Arts and Recreation, launched a $10 million package to help athletes. National Athletics Association of Zimbabwe President Tendai Tagara said they were happy some of their athletes will get assistance during this difficult time. Hi, this is Mike Mandel and you can catch me and the team for all the latest breaking news out of the world of sport, local as well as international on your favorite station, my station, your station, ZFM. We are Z Team on ZFM Sport. Z. From the front of the grid to the back of the net, it's ZFM Sport. International Sports News Roundup, where the world comes out to play. All right, on to that story that Mike has been telling us about, about Bowden Barrett, where, according to English writer Stuart Barnes, Bowden Barrett is at risk of losing out on his spot as a starting All Black in favor of Richie Moonga and Damian McKenzie. In 2019, the All Blacks utilized a dual playmaker system in the hope of getting their best players on the field at the same time with Barrett, the most affected, shifting to fullback instead of his preferred position of first five, which is fly half. While the change did come off in patches, namely in the All Blacks' pool victory over eventual World Cup winner South Africa, the semi-final defeat to England showed that the system has its flawed. New All Blacks coach Ian Foster, though, earlier this month stated his intention to continue using the dual playmaker strategy. If you look at a couple of variables, I mean, I think it's we've seen Richie Grown, you know, from his first start. Um, uh, and I thought against South Africa he took a while to get into it and we saw signs near the end and I thought again we saw signs that you know looking about how many times they're touching the ball it's 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 positive so we're not sort of um, we're not dampening one player to increase the, the playmaking ability of the other player so we're getting good balance there and and, and I think from a Bodie perspective um, you know we talk about the, the two of them but it, it's a pretty big success story. I think that Bodie can um, be one of the leading tens in the world and then go back and, and suddenly he's, I thought the last two tests he's probably been our best player in the park at, te- at 15. So he's actually made that transition really, really well. So it's given us some good options. Z. <laughs> and I'm so glad to discuss this matter. We have a rugby aficionado right here on the show. Michael Madur. <laughs> Your thoughts on this one? Listen, in truth, I can't see. I can't see it. I can't see Bowden Barrett losing his, 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 his place on the basis that all black rugby knows what Bowden Barrett can deliver. The whole world knows what Bowden Barrett can deliver. So do we know about Richie Moonga? We know that he can, he can deliver quality. And Damian McKenzie as well. But I don't see there being a him or him scenario. I think it's just a great pool of players. Uh, I think this is uh, one of those articles or discussions, Barry, that's uh, just designed uh, to feed discussion, especially uh, in these times when there's not a lot of content and uh, news going about. (laughs) Uh, Why I say that? Uh, Because uh, Damien McKenzie is a player I love. He's a player I like. Uh, but I view him more as an impact player. I think he's always done well for the All Blacks when he's come off the bench. Uh, broken play, uh, when the opposition is slowing down uh, and there are a lot of gaps for him to exploit. He is the best in the world when it comes to that. So I don't see him being uh, the regular fullback uh, for the All Blacks because if they were serious about having a discussion around which 15 to choose, then it's got to be a clash between the Barrett brothers, uh, Borden and, and, and yes. Jody Barrett. Because if you take a look yeah. at the performances of Jody Barrett at the Hurricanes, ever since he's put on the number 15 jumper, he's been arguably the best fullback in rugby at Aroa. So that's a more serious discussion that we can have to say, you know what, what do we yeah. do with the conundrum of uh, the two Barrett brothers? Uh, who gets to start? And because for me, 
if you take a look at the All Blacks in terms of their most dynamic player, their most lethal player, their most creative player, that player is Borden Barrett. They talk about him yeah. moving to 15 at the World Cup. That's a personal sacrifice that he made. If he was a selfish player, he'd have insisted on saying, listen, I'm the best number 10 in the world, play me at 10. Okay, so he made that sacrifice to accommodate Richie Mwanga. And the problem is that the All Blacks made that experiment or did that experiment too late because those are two critical positions. Barry, you know that fly half, you are literally the conductor of the orchestra and you cannot Absolutely. make such a monumental change, I think, so late in the day. And so that's what affected the All Blacks. The reason why um, the new coach, Ian Foster, is insisting that he's going to stick with it is because now there is no tournament rugby. This is the time to do it. I would have loved to see the All Blacks do that in 2017, two years prior to the World Cup. They would have had a bidding in period where they would have tried it and seen if it works. When they went to the World Cup, it was almost like it was a, a rabbit they were pulling out of the, the, the hat. It worked in that full game versus South Africa. And then it was like, okay, if it works against the box, let's stick with it. It may work for the rest of the tournament. Unfortunately, it didn't because they weren't able to get the best out of Borden Barrett at fullback. Uh, Chris, are we reaching here? Uh, I mean, Mike, Mike is quite rightly pointing out that there's a, there are far more important things that we could discuss, far more interesting things that we could discuss rather than the dropping of uh, Bowden Barrett. And uh, my, my, my issue there being that, is this the world uh, uh, looking at the All Blacks and thinking to themselves, these guys are about to switch it up again. They're about to change the game again. And re if this dual playmaker role works, then... Rugby will be changed forever and we all have to move in that direction. We're not ready for that. 100%. I think um, just for me, what was telling about the article was some of the things they were referencing and trying to string along as part of the argument. Um, there was, you know, quoting some polls where some people even insisted that they wouldn't pick him um, to start the next all black test. And if you look at that particular poll, it's got 125 votes on it. So, I mean, <laughs> it's not particularly reflective of the entire, you know, what the world thinks of Bowden Barrett as. Um, a player. Another argument they use is they take a look at um, in uh, the next Rugby World Cup, he's going to be 32 years old, so um, he's not necessarily going to be the best player that we could have, and so we need to make that change now. He needs to move away from that position now. And it's a lot of reaching, it's a lot of um, making assumptions, it's, it's yeah, it's just, it's reaching at this point and just the way the article for me is written, the way um, they've gone about discussing the point, for me it's one big reach and using social media discussions as kind of evidence of his argument for me yeah, was just yeah. telling. So I think it's, it's people being uncomfortable um, yeah. and just looking for something to talk about. Super Rugby Atero fixtures this weekend. Super Rugby Atero has reached the halfway point and after five rounds, the Crusaders have a six-point lead over the Blues. This weekend, Super Rugby New Zealand uh, kicks off in Wellington where the Hurricanes host the Auckland Blues. On Sunday, the Waikato Chiefs are back in Hamilton and they host the Otago Highlanders. The Chiefs have played the Highlanders 33 times in Super Rugby since 1996 and the Chiefs have won 18 matches, lost 14 and drawn once. There's also rugby in Australia, Super Rugby AU. The first game of the weekend was played earlier today and the Queensland Reds beat the Western Force 31-24 in a scrappy but highly entertaining encounter. Tomorrow, New South Wales Waratahs Super Rugby head coach Rob Penny has named a team with a number of changes to the side that beat the Force for tomorrow's match against the Brisbane Brumbies. The match will be the Waratahs' second successive game on home soil and they will come back Tom Robertson from injury with Carmichael Hunt and Jack Dempsey also returning to the starting side. Hi, I'm Jesse Creel, Springbok and Blue Bulls backline player. You are listening to ZFM Sports. Around the world in 60 seconds. International sports news. Around the world in 60 is proudly brought to you by DSTV. We take off in Manchester where Joffre Archer's biosecure breach could have been a disaster for English cricket, costing tens of millions of pounds. English seamer Archer went home to Brighton between the first and second test against West Indies, contravening strict guidelines. The managing director of men's cricket at the ECB, Ashley Giles, suggested the pace bowler had 
had rest the entire summer schedule. We head over to Ohio where Tony Finau ended a high-scoring first day with the outright lead as Rory McIlroy and Tiger Woods both made encouraging starts to the Memorial Tournament with Marfield Village playing substantially tougher than the relatively friendly setup for the last week's workday charity open on the same course. Only 24 of one of the strongest fields in PGA Tour history managed to break par in the opening round. Action at the Memorial Tournament continues throughout the weekend. Which is in Florida, where NBA scoring leader James Harden practiced with his Houston Rockets teammates for the first time in more than four months yesterday, saying his arrival at the league's restart bubble at Walt Disney World was delayed by family issues. Harden came to Disney earlier this week, satisfied his league mandatory quarantine requirements, and was cleared to participate. Harden's arrival means that Houston finally have half of their starting backcourt at Disney. On Monday, guard Russell Westbrook revealed that he tested positive for coronavirus. It's not known when Westbrook will be ready to arrive. Hi, I'm Varios Coach Zdravko Lugarusic and you are listening to ZFM Sport. Sports with a difference. Z. The big leagues. The big teams. The big players. The beautiful game on ZFM Sport. The league that makes football oh so beautiful where artistry and strokes of genius are the order of any day. Where the game is played with a smile and the little master creates his magic. All the news from the Spanish La Liga on ZFM Sport. There's a big party in Spain and of course that party is in Madrid and their manager Zinedine Zidane has hailed Real's latest La Liga triumph as one of his best days in the professional game. Karim Benzema scored twice as Los Blancos defeated Villarreal 2-1 at the Estadio Alfredo Di Stefano to secure the trophy with a game to spare. Madrid won 10 straight games since La Liga restarted after the break caused by the coronavirus pandemic while it marks the first Silver, where they have won since Zidane returned for a second spell as head coach last March. Now, Zidane has now won 11 trophies over his two spells and dedicated the title to Madrid supporters who could only watch the game from home, as well as the coronation, I suppose. I'm very happy with everything I have won. This one has a special feeling after being locked up at home for two months. We came back and prepared ourselves in a different way and we managed to win our league. And for me, the Spanish league is the most difficult league to win. We did so successfully and that's based on a lot of sacrifices. I don't know what I'm going to do now, but I'm just so happy. So thank you for your messages. Z. Chris, what we have seen from Real Madrid, uh, it has been a story of, to be honest, um, resolve. It's been a story where Real Madrid has really gone about their business admirably since the restart. And they've won the title that they set out to win. Definitely. Um, I think we've seen a lot of grit from Real Madrid being able to get results every single week since the restart. And I think that's kind of what set them apart from Barcelona is that after the restart, they were able to kick on and get a very good run of results. I think it fueled their confidence. You had a number of players contributing goals for Real Madrid. And I think that's what made the difference between them and Barcelona and them for them to be able to um, get the trophy this season. I think also... Um, Real Madrid's been playing at 100% in every single match. But if you take a look at Barcelona, it's almost like they're operating at about 80, 90% efficiency. And Real Madrid has gone completely all out with all of their players and even making some um, selections that we've kind of been questioning. What about this player? What about that player? But they've ensured that whatever happens, they get that result at the end of the match. Barry, we talk about uh, good sides or title-winning sides having a very strong spine. And you you take a look at Real Madrid's spine, Thibaut Courtois in goal, Sergio Ramos at centre-back, Casemiro at uh, holding midfield, and uh, Karim Benzema up top at the tip of the arrow. Those four players have been arguably their standout performers. Yes, and uh, just like Chris said, if you look at the performances of those players uh, post-lockdown, 
uh, that's what's made the difference. They have been almightily consistent. Uh, they've managed to do their jobs and more. What am I talking about in terms of and more? Sergio Ramos uh, becoming becoming the designated penalty uh, taker. Real Madrid getting lots of penalties after uh, the the lockdown. They needed to still tuck them into the back of the net and make that uh, old onion bag bulge. And that's exactly what he was doing, Sergio Ramos. Uh, Karim Benzema, he needed to do more in terms of link-up play, uh, getting involved between the lines. He certainly did that as well as delivering in the box. So, uh, and Casimiro, I mean, he's, he's, he's been a, a threat in both boxes, uh, able to put a tackle in and then also uh, being able to put in a final pass. So I think that spine has been absolutely consistent. Let's not even talk about Thibaut Courtois. He's, um, he's, uh, he's got a new lease of life at uh, Real Madrid and uh, fair juice to them, worthy champions. Worthy champions and uh, contributions coming from the entire squad, not just the starting 11 or the regular 11 players that we see uh, week in, week out uh, at Real Madrid. 21 different players, Chris, getting on the score sheet. I think uh, only backup defender Eda Militao as well as uh, rarely used winger Brahim Diaz are the only outfit players not to have scored. However, Will it concern Real Madrid, Chris, the fact that Karim Benzema, yes, he's been exceptional, but none of their other attackers or strikers have actually scored more than three goals. You'd have expected a bigger or a greater contribution from his fellow strikers. Definitely. And I think think it's something that they should be, um, I don't know if concern is the right word, maybe something they need to pay attention to. Um, something that they need to pay attention to particularly because it it might have worked for this particular spell for them where they just needed to get the results week in week out but as we've seen in the English Premier League fatigue becomes a very real part of um, the play and especially taking a look at next season they need more players who are able to contribute larger volumes of goals if they're going to for example um take Liga again if they're going to go, go into the Champions League and have a very good run they need more people to contribute goals that over reliance on one particular player will always come back to haunt a team and they need to make sure that that spread of goals is also with the rest of the attacking players well, some of the players very that expected to leave. Gareth Bale, we saw him in those title celebrations, aloof, uh, disinterested. Uh, he wasn't engaged at all. Another player expected to depart is James Rodriguez, a man that I say has been stealing a living as a footballer <laughs> since that wonder volley at the 2014 <laughs> World Cup. Those two players will need to be replaced. Uh, Eden Hazard hasn't been dependable because of injuries that he has suffered this season. Uh, so they'll need to bring in at least one or two more attackers to complement uh, Karim Benzema. They certainly will. And, and you've got to think to yourself that, albeit that they might lose money uh, on both those players on their way out, I think the money that they'll make, uh, they will be able to bring in uh, a reasonably enough quality or at least the quality that's willing to work for the team, work for the side. Um, you've pointed out the fact that Gareth Bale is disinterested. And I think it's it's come through in his play all season long. Um, at times he's looked like he's engaged. At times he's looked like um, he can he can do the business, and we know he can. But you've got to do more than that when you're at a side like Real Madrid. You've got to do it week in week out, and he's he's not going to do that for them. So it's better that they ship him out. Yes, bring in more attackers. They must. Uh, Gareth Bale, James Rodriguez uh, are, are definitely on their way out and I completely agree with you. Let's give you a recap of last night's results. Aiba with a fantastic 3-1 home win over Real Valladolid. Athletic Club beaten at home by Leganes 2-0. Barcelona beaten by Osasuna at the Camp New 2-1. We'll get to hear the comments of Chris just now on some of the comments that came out of Lionel Messi post that match. Salta Vigo going down to Levante 3-2 in a 5-goal thriller. Atletico Madrid too good for Getafe 2-0 on the road. Mallorca beaten at home by Granada 2-1. Similar result for Alaves on the road versus Real Betis. Real Sociedad goalless draw with Sevilla. Valencia 1-0 victors over already relegated Espanyol. And of course uh, the game that underlined or confirmed Real Madrid's championship status 2-1 over Villarreal. Now Chris Messi unhappy with last night's performance but more than that he's criticized Barcelona for being weak he's not happy with the way the campaign has gone especially I'm sure post restart you know after the restart Barcelona has just not been at the races and Messi is looking at a season that could end up with basically no trophy in the cabinet where Barcelona has been used to winning at least something 
uh, in a season. They might not win the Champions League, but they've always won the league. Or they don't win the, the Champions League, they win a double, the league and the Copa del Rey. This season, they'll really have to do well to win the Champions League, which is the only trophy that they are playing for. Definitely. Um, I think Barcelona, he's, first of all, he's rightfully critical of Barcelona. Um, he's definitely said that, you know what, things need to change and that they actually need to do better. And I don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with him on that. Barcelona have definitely not been their best since the restart. And they've squandered opportunities and in particular matches where we look at it and say they deserve this particular win. And it was, it was a very slim margin of results. They could have cracked on and won that. And they've squandered those opportunities. So he's, he's rightfully um, upset with the way things have turned out and it could be a season where we see Barcelona possibly not getting anything this season but it's also because they're not playing at their best I think that's why he's incredibly critical is we haven't seen a good Barcelona side we've seen a Barcelona side that's been there or thereabouts only Dembele Barry is back in training De Jong Frankie De Jong they say that he could be back in the next couple of weeks and uh, these two players will be a big boost for Barcelona if they're to have any designs whatsoever on European glory yeah, a big boost and uh, you, you, you can you sort of see that Barcelona was just lacking that, that, that extra bit of quality that extra bit uh, to, to take them over the edge um, uh, Ricky Puig uh, looks like a a proper prospect, he looks like a, a fantastic player, but there are elements where he's still wet behind the ears. So you need a Frankie de Jong to come in there and uh, deliver the re- results. Uh, Ansu Fati, you can see he's the real deal. He's he's got he's going to kick on. He's going to be one of the great ones. Uh, but again, the experience of a Dembele is going to add to 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 the quality going forward in that position. So for me, I think uh, going into the Champions League, they've got a lot to look forward to. Uh, you say it's going to be tough to win the Champions League. I agree. Okay, La Liga. They call it uh, quits or they call it a wrap this coming Sunday. It's the final match day in Spain and your fixtures are Real Valladolid versus Real Betis. A battle between two strugglers there. Alaves versus Barcelona. Atletico Madrid entertain Real Sociedad. Espanyol versus Celta Vigo. Athletic Club are away at Granada whilst Leganes entertain the champions Real Madrid who no doubt will be given a god of honour. Levante versus Getafe. Osasuna high on confidence after winning in the Camp Nou. They welcome Mallorca. Sevilla versus Valencia is the pick off of the fixtures. Both sides, to be honest, with nothing to play for. Sevilla having confirmed their Champions League status. And then the final fixture will see Villarreal taking on Aiba. All the rivalry. Here is Harry Kane for Tottenham. the stars. Oh, back here is Liverpool, two in front. Talk about impudence. Talk about improvisation. Talk about Sadio Mane. And all the game-changing moments. And Raheem Sterling rattles at home. And once more, City are in front in a choice. All the updates from the Premier League on ZFM Sport. In England, Leicester City boss Brendan Rodgers challenged his team to, quote, make more history after victory over Sheffield United secured European football for next season. A first half strike by Jose Perez and Damari Gray's counter-attacking goal ensured the Foxes stay fourth, a point behind third place Chelsea with two games remaining. Their win also means they qualify for next season's Europa League at least. But Rodgers wants Leicester to secure Champions League football for a second time after becoming Premier League title winners in that memorable season in 2016. Let's hear from the boss at Leicester. I think we, we've always said, let's see where we're at at the end of the season. We, um, it, it was one of the ones where, way back in the summer, the, the, the big... The, uh, the big target for us was could we get to European football you know forget top four it was about could we get into Europe because that was going to be a huge challenge for a club like ourselves if you think of the clubs and the, and the, and the budgets that is around uh, above ourselves so for us the, the players over the course of the season have been outstanding and tonight we've, uh, we've confirmed the, high, you know, the second highest finish in the history of the club and you know European football so so now let's see we two games to go where we end up Z.
Chris, Brendan Rodgers challenging his team to make more history and uh, we've seen them to be a historic side. And uh, look, we are all pleasantly surprised and enjoying the ride that Leicester are doing. But in truth, their shrewd appointments, their, their, their prudence in the transfer market, their ability to assemble a team means that this team is going to hang around that top six, top eight for many, many years. Yeah, for many, many years, definitely agree with you. Um, if you take a look at um, their performances this season before uh, the coronavirus enforced break, they were on a good run as well. I think after the break, they've had a bit of um, an interesting return, to put it that way. Uh, but you can see that this is a team that definitely, when given the opportunity, they'll be able to crack on. And when we're not going to be surprised to see them hanging around those Champions League places for years and years and years. Can they do it again was a question that we heard asked after that victory in 2016, Mike. And uh, in truth, this is a a testament to the fact that they possibly can if they continue on this upward trajectory because the the recruitment of Brendan Rodgers away from Celtic and bringing him to Leicester has worked. If he is uh, shrewd and is, has the ability to bring in quality players in the transfer windows, possibly two or three, the new next two or three uh, transfer windows, who knows? Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, we can talk about uh, having title ambitions. I think we can mm. talk about Leicester being a solid team in the upper echelons of the English Premier League. I think they are always going to fall short of your Liverpools, your Manchester Cities, your Manchester United, uh, and teams of that nature, Chelsea, because those teams have got far bigger budgets uh, and will be bringing in uh, the cream uh, of world talent. Uh, Leicester, whilst they are champions in 2016, but they are hardly an attractive side. Uh, they are out in the Midlands and uh, they are not a side that's going to be turning heads uh, when it comes to European uh, European football's top talent. So they're going to always be uh, there, thereabouts. Uh, so for me, very an important game for them. You know, they're playing Tottenham. They need to win that game to make sure that uh, when they host Manchester United, they've still got fate in their hands. And uh, knowing that yeah. if they beat United on the final day, they make the Champions League. Um, the fixtures have gone their way somewhat with Chelsea having to go to Anfield uh, this coming week and to win there to also make sure yeah. that they have fate in their own hands. Uh, so it's very interesting the way the fixtures have fallen, uh, but we got some very interesting uh, ties uh, over the last two match days to see which of the three, which of the two three sides between United, Chelsea and Leicester qualify for the Champions League. A recap of last night's result, uh, a draw at uh, um, uh, Goodison Park. Everton, one all draw with Aston Villa. Another draw in the south on the south coast, uh, Southampton drawing with Brighton, one all. And then Manchester United uh, doing what they're doing a lot these days, winning 2-0 at Sellers Park in London at Crystal Palace. Now, your weekend Premier League fixtures look like this. West Ham versus Watford, Norwich City versus Burnley, Bournemouth versus Southampton, and it is Tottenham Hotspur entertaining Leicester City. Their FA Cup semi-finals, uh, and we'll do a, a quick uh, recap. Uh, City will entertain Arsenal. I say entertain, but it's at Wembley. And then United will take on Chelsea. Bottom line, guys, is we've got a blockbuster FA Cup final on the cards, most definitely, don't we? A definitely blockbuster if you take a look at City and Arsenal, Arsenal high on confidence after that win against Liverpool um, a few days ago. Manchester City themselves being absolutely ruthless with every single match that they're playing. Um, United versus Chelsea is going to be a battle of the inconsistent. If you ask me, if you take a look at their performance in the league, they haven't been two particularly um, consistent sides. But when they do come to play, it's it's absolutely incredible. All out attacking football. So definitely blockbuster encounters up this weekend. I think the one thing that will make that uh, Chelsea United game interesting is that both sides will believe that they can win. Uh, yes. And uh, that that's what will make it very interesting. So it's all about which side comes best prepared and uh, which side is able to assert itself uh, early on in that game. Because uh, I, I think it's evenly balanced. Like Chris said, they've been largely inconsistent. The teams, when they're good, they've been very good. When they're poor, they've also been quite poor. Uh, and so <laughs> it just depends which side is able to show up on the day. So it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Arsenal, I'll be very surprised if they can get a result over, over City. Uh, I, I think this one very could surprised. be a question of us uh, counting the goals. You know, will it be two, three, very or four? Surprised. Yeah, look, I, I, I don't think uh, 
Arsenal, unless the, the, the Juju man is able to cast a spell <laughs> on the, the City defence, uh, mm. the way that he cast a spell on the Liverpool defence, uh, Arsenal, I don't see a victory. And then, listen, it's hard to be dismissive before the game is played, but ah, City are just looking at they, they need They need Ian Wright to go and urinate behind the Man City goal. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a fire stadium, Mike. <laughs> that might work. <laughs> the Nerazzurri, the Black and Blues, Inter Milan. It's Romelu Lukaku, and it was never in doubt. He's a beast at the best of times, but this season he has become a monster. The Giallo Rossi, the Yellow and Reds, AS Roma. Belotti has a go! Tremendous hits! That's what he's capable of! La Viola, the purple ones, Fiorentina. Brock Ribery seals a glorious win for Fiorentina with a sumptuous goal at San Siro. The Bianconeri, the black and whites, Juventus. Ronaldo seals yet another three points for Juventus. Tough yet colourful, the best of Italian football on Z. Quick update from Syria. Inter Milan eased past bottom side spell last night, winning 4-0 away to move second in Syria and close the gap on leaders Juventus to six points with five games left. Your Syria weekend fixtures. Hellas Verona takes on Atalanta. Cagliari versus Sassuolo. AC Milan takes on Bologna. Parma versus Sampdoria. Brescia versus Spal. Fiorentina versus Torino Genoa against Lecce, Napoli versus Udinese and Roma takes on Inter Milan. Those Serie A fixtures bringing us to the end of our Friday edition of ZFM Sport. Have a great weekend, Zimbabwe. May God richly bless you. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Manande, out. And it's Messi! It is the cleanest of clean finishes from the best on the planet. The biggest sports stories. Liverpool... Champions of Europe on top of the world. The biggest interviews. That uh, such a great spectacle is ruined by such such thuggish behavior. And all the analysis right here. He's the one player that has the arrogance to think that he can play in any stadium in the world and any pitch in the world in front of any player in the world and take them on. Every weekday, it's my sport, it's your sport. It's ZFM Sport on ZFM Stereo. My station, your station.